Um, yes. And we have already an attendee. And we, we won't be able to know who they are necessarily, will we? Oh, that did not. Um, Look at the participants. Hold on. I will share with you the list of attendees post webinar when I send you the survey results as well. Sounds Great. good. Welcome to all of those who are joining us. Talcott, how uh, closely do we need to stay to the hour time? Uh, we'll get started just about exactly at 1030. And then just to do your best, people will stay if they can, if okay. we go over. Um, okay. I'm very flexible. So it's just a matter of participants' own flexibility sure. with their schedules. Yeah, not having done this before, it's, I mean, we'll, we'll do our best to keep it to that hour, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We stray. Yeah, and this is a great first experience for you because I'm super flexible and Wixap is as well. So. Yeah, that well, is a great thankful. experience for us. <laughs> thank, thank you. you for, thank you for having us. <clears throat> help but want to make changes to the slides as they see them on the screen but <laughs> that, that, that's always true Does that work or not really, you guys? My back, the background. No, it doesn't. Just does did it? something to your face. So, um, yeah. yeah. Never mind. Yeah, there are lines on your face. Never mind. I tried. It's fine. You can't even see my face because well, of I, I, it's the actually, sunlight. It's shadow. Yeah, let me go. Fix the lighting. We believe it's you. <laughs> Can you see Mia, Amy? I can't, but I took a video. No, where is she? No, I can't, but I took behind a, me over my right shoulder. She's yeah. sleeping. She's sleeping. I took a video of her when I looked in through your car window yesterday while you were in the office and I saved it for a resource for me because it was so adorable. <laughs> She's such a sweetheart. She may wander in. Yeah, for those That's of you watching, it's not a bear, it's a dog. Yeah. It just looks like a bear. <laughs> and I 
No need I to fed, be alarmed. <laughs> I fed my cat lots right before we got on that way she won't bug me. because As soon yeah. as I'm not giving her attention, that's when she wants it. I had to do this morning, um, like I had, was really intentional with that shift between see child abuse investigations and adult gen, because that's what I've been last night. I worked on that for about four hours late. Um, and so there's such a, there's such an important difference between those two courses. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Well, Terminology, I'll be sure to verbiage. mention it if you happen to see, say CAIA. <laughs> Although yeah. that was the inspiration for this training, a lot of it was. So. Well, and it's such a good model that, mm -hmm. well, but what we've done here is. Oh, some of our actors, I think I mentioned this to you in passing, but they, um, they're so eager they're so excited to work on this. Um, I reached out to four and all four of them are available for our pilot. Right. And and, it's, and instead of just confirming, they're like, we are so excited for this. This is the first time we've... Um, yeah, with all our canceled classes, I'm sure they were. Yeah. When I thought some of our actors had worked with the Alliance and when the Alliance sent me their list of actors, they're not the same ones, so... Um, mm -hmm. But they're going to be comfortable with, they're excited to try the platform, the WebEx platform. So many platforms. Just watching those numbers rise. It's great. Good morning, everyone, as you're joining. Hi there. That was a cute message. Can you see me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like, no worries, no worries. <laughs> Good morning, Michael and Jeff. Well, we're going to get started. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to have you. My name is Talcott Broadhead, and I am here from the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs also known as WICSAP. And welcome to the webinar, an informational overview for advocates of the Washington Sexual Assault Investigations Training. As I said, I'm from WICSAP and I'm the organizer for today's webinar, though I'm not the trainer. The Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs is a nonprofit organization that strives to unite agencies engaged in the elimination of sexual violence. WICSAP provides information, training, and expertise to program and individual members who support victims, family and friends, the general public, and all of those whose lives have been affected by sexual assault. Before I get started and introduce our presenters today, I want to go over some logistical information about this webinar. To begin with, all participants, attendees, you're muted and we can't see your video, so don't worry. <laughs> Um, this webinar, um, throughout the presentation, as I said, your line will be muted. However, there is a chat box as well as a question and answer Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please ask questions or give comments throughout the webinar. If your question does not get answered right away, we will have time at the end of the webinar. We'll also keep track of the needs throughout. And if we aren't able to get to your questions, we will address them via email in our follow-up materials that we send to each attendee. The materials from this presentation, including this webinar, will be recorded, archived, and posted 
on the WICSAP website later this week. That's WCSAP.org. If you're sharing a computer with a colleague or you've phoned in, please email me at T-A-L-C-O-T-T -T at WICSAP.org with your email address so that I can acknowledge you with my follow-up email. I'm sure most people aren't sharing computers right now, but this is clearly my script from <laughs> the pre-pandemic days. This webinar counts as one hour of continuing education credits, and this will again be confirmed in your follow-up email. <clears throat> Please take a few moments after the webinar when I do send you the email to fill out a survey. This is very helpful for us in developing future trainings and also just as um, facilitators and trainers ourselves. We really appreciate feedback. <clears throat> so without further ado, <coughs> I'm going to introduce Jen Wallace and Jen will introduce her colleague Amy. Jen Wallace is the program manager for sexual assault investigations sorry, at the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission, CJTC. She joined CJTC after a career as a criminal investigator and supervisor with the U.S. Department of Defense in Seattle and Syracuse, New York. Jen worked as a civilian with the Seattle Police Department's High Risk Victims Unit on a federal human trafficking grant and served as a volunteer with the SPD's victim support team as she learned about the neurobiological and behavioral impacts of trauma and the importance of collaborating with various victim service providers and subject matter experts in cases involving various forms of violence and abuse. With its multidisciplinary team approach, Jen and the training cadre have delivered 14 trainings to over 275 officers throughout Washington State. So welcome, Jen. We're so happy to have you today. Thank you. Good morning, Talcott. I have a question just as we, we start this. Will this uh, yes. PowerPoint be available to all the participants? If you would like it to be, yes. I'd like to make that available. Great so. question, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Great to be here with all of you this morning, wherever you are, likely most of you tucked in your homes. Um, this certainly wasn't what we had anticipated when uh, I was planning this in the early planning phases. I think it was January when I was uh, talking to uh, Michelle Dixon Wall about setting this up. Um, but here we are. So thank you for being here and, and making the time in your schedules and also spending additional time. I know lots of us are spending a lot of time on screens these days. So, you know, bear with us and we'll try to get uh, to, to as much of this information and make it as uh, dynamic for you uh, as possible. Uh, I also wanted to introduce uh, one of my colleagues who agreed to, to participate today, Amy Gallardo. I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about her background, but she has been uh, one of our, our key uh, instructors and also one of the key architects of, of this training program. So Amy, if you could uh, let the participants know a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Jen. And good morning, everybody. Um, I am, um, like she said, I'm Amy Gallardo, and I'm very fortunate to have worked on um, the developing curriculum with the sexual assault investigation program. Um, and I think that's also because I've worked on the child abuse investigation and assessment program for many years, um, also with the Criminal Justice Training Commission. My history, or the, my um, background is um, an investigator for the Yakima County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. And I've also worked in the past with two different community sexual assault programs. And so I'm a huge um, advocate for Washington, um, sec Washington State sexual assault um, programs. I am also a community resiliency model instructor trainer and so we're going to be talking to you about these wellness skills um, as we proceed into our presentation. Um, I can attach my bio if anybody's interested but that's just uh, like a nutshell. And as we get started, I just wanted to thank you, Amy, and thank you all of you for the important work you're doing out there in facilitating 
the healing of victims and survivors of sexual assault. So uh, right from the outset, I want to just acknowledge that important work. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we tend to do when we start our trainings is that we just acknowledge that there may be uh, survivors among us. Um, and there we've, we've actually started a couple of courses by having people dedicate their the training to a victim or survivor and sometimes we'll get some uh, some officers who will reveal uh, either um, their own um, abuse or those of known friends or family members but often they they dedicate this to to the victims and survivors they're working with uh, at, at their respective departments so it's just a way of kind of humanizing um, the work we're doing um, so uh, we, uh, our class, uh, uh, Sexual Assault Investigations, we call it Victim-Centered Engagement and Resiliency Tactics, and we'll tell you, we'll explain more that, that I think the, the reason for that title will be clearer as we go along. We call it VCERT for short, so if you hear us referring to VCERT, that's what we're talking about. So getting that acronym out of the way early, we have a tendency for those. Uh, already page down. Why? Okay, here it is. All right. So just the the training background. Um, this was a state mandate, uh, and uh, in the mandate, it essentially uh, required uh, the Criminal Justice Training Commission (CJTC), another acronym you might hear a few times. Um, to create a trauma-informed victim-centered interviewing training for all the officers who regularly conduct adult sexual assault investigations. So the requirement was for these officers to, who are, who've been doing these cases to participate in the training by July 1st. Of course, with these current conditions, I think we've moved that date. We've had to cancel some trainings. Um, and I think that requirement has, has shifted but there was there the requirement exists for officers. So all I mean, and we are I, as far as I know, we are one of the the first states to to have uh, this type of mandate for for training. So Washington, we can be proud of Washington State of uh, being a leader in this area. Um, but you can I I reference the RCW if you want to find more about it. We really use that as a blueprint for the training. We looked at the content of that. Um, it, some, some of which was created by uh, the former ED of WICSAP, uh, Andrea Piper Wentland. Uh, she worked uh, closely with Representative Tina Orwall and other legislators on that legislation. And that, that really, that was our, um, again, our blueprint for the creation of this training. And I think we've, we pretty closely, we, we've done our best to follow it and adjusted where and when needed. Um, so that's a background. If you want to know more about that statute, I, I recommend that you just you know, throw it in your, your Google search. Uh, and the contributors and, and training team, well, I'll talk more about this shortly, but you know, just like uh, we would expect in, in investigations, we wanted to make sure that we put together a training team that included that multidisciplinary team. Um, so uh, we have various backgrounds uh, represented in our training, teaching different instruction blocks uh, to the officers. Uh, and then in, in terms of statistics, uh, we've, had, we've had 11 classes, so the numbers that, that Talcott read up earlier, uh, the, those were projections. We expected to have three more classes by now, um, but those were canceled. And so the numbers, instead of 275 officers who've been through the training, it's, it's 223 at this point, uh, representing 19 counties. And we'll give you some more graphics on those shortly. Um, and those trainings, most of them have occurred in Burien at the training academy, but we were able to take some trainings on the road and had lots of uh, road trips planned <laughs> for these last couple months in Vancouver and Wenatchee specifically. But uh, we, we've been to Spokane, Bellingham, Pierce County, and Bremerton uh, with, with the course. So now back to the contributors. Uh, we, we, we like to pay homage to all of our contributors by, the, uh, by referencing them in our student manual. So you can see these lists of, of various agencies or representatives of these agencies who contributed to, to building that training. 
Um, you can see right at the very top of that list is Wixap. So, um, you know, we're, we're thrilled to have their, uh, their involvement in, in developing this training. And it isn't, it isn't necessarily in any particular order, uh, but it, you know, in terms of who, who contributed the most, that's just those just are the different uh, resources that we sought in, in developing this training. So you have a sense of those contributors. And we have the, uh, the breakdown of counties. Uh, again, there are 19 counties represented here. If you don't see yours, <laughs> um, I'd be curious to know about that. I haven't, I haven't looked at the, the map of Washington State and, and it could be that, that some uh, of the participants were planning to attend. I know, for instance, down in, uh, in Clark County, we were expecting to have, and I don't know that they're listed there, uh, a lot of Vancouver, a lot of folks from that that region in our in our class back in March that was canceled. So uh, that doesn't necessarily, by looking at this, that doesn't necessarily mean that there weren't people planning to to come to our class classes. Um, obviously, most of rep of our representation has been out of King County uh, because most of our classes have been out of Burien, and we've had you know. A, a few months, typically what happens is an officer will, will have you know, somebody they're working with attend the class with them. And then in terms of rank, as you can see, and no surprise here either, uh, we've had mostly had officers. And when, when we reference officers who participated, this could be, they could also be conducting those investigations. You know, uh, particularly in some of these smaller departments where maybe they, their patrol officers and the detective and everything else for that, that department. Uh, but at least when we've asked people to kind of identify their background or their role, they listed themselves as officers. I mean, 43 detector, detectives, 35 deputies. And then the miscellaneous, I just wanted to reference, we had some coordinators in particular from, from some of the, uh, the cities up north uh, who work in departments, uh, participate in interviews with police officers who, who uh, asked to participate in the training. And um, so they, th that, that's what some of those miscellaneous, that miscellaneous char uh, uh, characterization represents. Um, uh, as we were talking about earlier, in, in uh, before all of you came on, we sometimes have uh, or we've had observers in the class from different organizations who have an interest in the training and just kind of want to see and experience how it's being conducted, which we find very helpful because then we can get to the perspectives of those particular individuals and their agencies as, as we go through the training. And I was also <laughs> saying that back in December, uh, we had a surprise with Representative Tina Orwell walk into the training, which was a delight to have her. She was, she was very engaged, very interested in the work we were doing. And so it was really a thrill to have her uh, participate and give, give us her feedback on, on the training. So. so I don't think we have legislator on that, <laughs> on that list. <laughs> she didn't take the training though, she was an observer. So just uh, uh, in terms of what we do with the training, we know that this is a really dense class. And Amy knows, I mean, we've uh, practically every class is a little different. We've found features of it, either things, more information that we needed or information that is redundant. So we're constantly changing the order, of the chronology of our, of our uh, subjects. Uh, we've mostly stayed with the same subjects. Um, and we, we, all, we always, uh, request uh, some pre-course materials from the participants because, because it is so dense and we want them to have some materials just to uh, process before they even come to the class. Um, so that, that they're coming with, uh, with, with some of that knowledge, although many of them are already, but we wanna make sure that, that, they, have, they, have at, that, that they know about the End Violence Against Women International website that has a lot of online training. We have them identify courses that they're interested in that particular training. Some of them even take those courses before coming to the training, which is really exciting for us. We have them go to the WICSAP website because we want them to be familiar with that as, as a resource. And then they highlight a couple of things in that website that are of value of, of importance to them. 
Um, and if any of you have seen Rebecca Campbell's post-it note video, that's a good way for them to get some understanding of trauma if, they, if, if they're not already working with it. She does a really great job in that particular video of explaining some of the neuroscience, as well as there's a, oops, I need to look there, um, animated trauma, it's called Trauma in the Brain video. Um, it's based on, uh, uh, it, was, it was developed or in Scotland um, in detective sexual assault uh, scenario, but that, that video does a, a pretty decent job as well. And then we have an IACP article that they read on bias so that, that they're walking into the class with at least uh, these, the, this information. Mm -hmm. So they all submit that to us. So we have a little bit of their background. Um, well, they have a little, little of the course materials, but we also ask them some questions about their background and experience. Uh, because one of the things that we do with that information is we build interviewing teams from that information. Um, right. and you'll hear more about uh, the interviewing process uh, uh, coming up. And so again, as yeah, go ahead. Well, and as Jen mentioned, um, we have definitely, since this, you know, is a newer program, we have definitely evolved. Um, so our, we maybe uh, began our course with different pre-course material, but because we've asked for ongoing uh, feedback with um, daily, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Daily evaluations, so thank you. So we have adjusted accordingly. And right now, currently, this is what our pre-course material look like. And we believe that it's pretty impactful based on um, how it fits in with our three-day course and also the feedback that we're currently getting. We've had a couple stakeholder meetings now where um, we talk about this. Is, this. is this effective? Is this appropriate? And based on our student feedback and then um, you know, our evaluations, it seems like it's working currently. That being said, we're always open to evolving. And as you'll see um, in the coming slides, that's what our course, um, each day of our course looks like as well. Yeah, so when we started in November, our very first course was November uh, 2018. Uh, they had oh, like 10 hours, 10 or 12 hours of pre-course material. I wasn't gonna mention the number. <laughs> <laughs> and we were we whittled that down to just a couple hours here at the most, and we and and that was based on finding uh, learning that a lot of these officers, I mean, they were really scrambling to get this done, and they were doing it on their own time, and it just uh, so we just we just tried to be more uh, more selective in those materials right. and maybe ask a few few less questions. So anyway it's a, it's uh, and it went from a three and a half day course to a three day course uh, based on some of the feedback we got from the officers just again the the sheer density of the information as well as the experiential component of the class and I think that's something I mean we'll be highlighting because it's that that experience of doing the interviews I think that probably and from the feedback we receive is where the officers learn learn the most it's great to have all this information all these different presenters but you know when they go in and they actually do the interviews with uh with actors with professional actors and interview facilitators in front of their peers i think that's that's probably where they get the um, uh, most education from from this course so as you can see day one it's all about uh the collaborations and in, in, on the investigation and the interviewing prep um, Day two is all interviewing uh, with the, those uh, professional actors in these scenarios that are uh, reality-based scenarios. And we'll talk more about that. And then day three, they get more of the investigation, which isn't necessarily part of the um, yeah. RCW. In require, I mean, although conducting a thorough investigation, we, it was important to, to give more context for the interviewing that, uh, that they're doing. And with with more investigative techniques and certainly evidence collection, offender focused investigations, and then having the uh, some perspective from prosecutors, um, as well as you know others on report writing and documentation. So uh, we'll talk more about that as we move forward. But that's that's basically how the three days are um, uh, segregated. 
So I know this is a lot of words to kind of absorb, but again, this was most of this was derived from the R RCW and what we could, we, what we took from that to uh, create learning objectives. And we had uh, some meetings before we launched the training. We had a stakeholder summit uh, in August of 2018, and then we had those those people individuals who are also interested in instruct in instructors come back and we develop these learning objectives that um, we've used uh, from the, the, the very uh, start of, of the training. And I have to tell you, uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm proud of with our team is that when we get these evaluations back, uh, we have 100% when we, we ask the questions, if we met, we list all these learning objectives and we ask if we met if, if their experience was that we met these learning objectives and for 100 percent of the time the feedback is that that we've met these learning objectives so that's something that um, that I'm proud of our, our, our cadre for for being able to do and I think one time somebody there was one mark that maybe we almost met one objective but aside from that we have a almost a perfect score there and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say that you know one of our the conducting interviews, this one here in the middle, conducting interviews using utilizing a research-based model that integrates wellness skills designed to minimize victim trauma, provide maximum emotional comfort, and reduce the number of interviews and foster resilience. Wow. That's the one I'd say if if any any particular objective best describes our training, that that's the one that does. And, and you'll hear more about that shortly. It's so strange to do this and not be able to ask you questions or see you. Mm -hmm. But we're all, it's, it's something we're all getting used to. All right. I think we're missing that engagement. Yes, we are. Which we're. All right. So just and then a breakdown of the topics each day, which may you may look at and means nothing to you. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a description on those. Uh, we do the case study. We start out after we do the introductions or dedications or you know some some personal aspect from the officers. Um, uh, we start with the case study of Chanel Miller Brock Turner down in Stanford, which was 2015 was when mm -hmm. the assault occurred, uh, and we do that because the in victim impact statement is so powerful, and uh, we had been using. Uh, I think New York Daily. Emily that, Emily Doe. Yeah, it was, it was was called Emily Doe, and we changed that in September. But uh, initially, we used a video from the Daily New York Daily News, where they had some of their I think their employees uh, talk uh, read sections of that impact statement before before Chanel Miller's identity was known. And then in September, while we were just the night before we started our class up in Bellingham, Bellingham. Uh, Chanel Miller was on uh, 60 Minutes. Uh, and so we have been using that, that impact statement and, and recognizing the value of that. It really gives them um, that victim perspective. Um, you know, it's very detailed. And um, so it's, it's, we found that it's a great way to start the class and just to, again, to offer that perspective. Uh, I think there are, there are certainly other examples out there, but that one um, has really stuck with us. And so we, we kind of reference this case uh, throughout the, the class. Um, and then the dynamics of sexual assault, we have, we have Andrea Piper Wentland most of the time uh, working with uh, a police officer, uh, Washington State University police officer, Curtis Whitman. And so to have the two of them talk about some of these dynamics has been really helpful. Uh, we have a um, therapist from uh, Rebuilding Hope in Tacoma, Stephanie Sachs, who talks about understanding victim re to response to trauma. If, and if you haven't seen her speak, she uh, she's a great uh, speaker. And and the uh, you, it, it, uh, it, <laughs> Amy and I both have a line that you know every time she talks, <laughs> we want to give her our insurance card <laughs> uh, for for billing purposes. But she, you know her understanding and her the way she conveys the impacts of trauma on on victims of sexual assault is is quite powerful and resonates with, um, uh, with the investigators. Yeah, with with the participants. So at that point, we get into the interview model just to go you know, into the background of that. Uh, we do some victim recall and resiliency. That's where we go. We talk a little bit more about 
the neurobiology and physiology of trauma and these wellness skills that we're going to introduce to you. Um, so we kind of combine those. And then we do an active li listening exercise uh, that kind of takes some of these components of the interviewing that, we, that we're seeking for, really that presence and engagement um, by the officers. And we weave those into an exercise where they're, they're talking to each other and they're, they're using, they're applying some of these wellness skills that we've just, we've just taught. So, um, you know, that, that tends to, you know, there's a, there can be, uh, Amy, I think you can attest to this, we, you know, a, some tension going into the training or just some awkwardness or discomfort um, from time to time in this, in, or just, uh, just be the culture. Uh, that, that there's, uh, and you know, we, we recognize that we're putting them in this, this position, this, this interviewing, which isn't natural for them, where they're being observed by their peers, and it's just uh, you know, this fabricated environment that they're required to do an interview. So by doing this actor, active listening exercise, they just get to remember what they already know. You know right. they, they relax a little bit with each other. They um, connect with each other in a way. We have them practice some wellness skills as part of that. So it's, it's become a very useful exercise yeah. for us in terms of just kind of getting them into the interviewing mode and, and kind of relaxing the class a little bit too. We see the class come, get, become more cohesive you know, once yeah. we do that exercise. Yeah, as Jen mentioned, it really changes the energy in the room. And not necessarily in this fantastic way. I mean, there, it's, it can be awkward for individuals and it can be um, a little more comfortable for others, but just, just the fact that we're engaging them in a way that they're not overly, from, they may not be overly familiar with, it's just, it really changes the energy in the room. And you know, some of them, right before that, Jen and I teach them the community resiliency model wellness skills, which we'll talk to you guys about, and some may have some background on wellness skills and others may not in our class I mean, because we have such a vast, um, we just have such different experience levels in our, in our course. And so just having them practice something that may be outside of their comfort zone, uh, it just really changes the energy, which is intentionally what we want for them to prepare for their practice interviews. Um, so it's, it's one of those activities that we've gone back and forth over, like whether we're going to adjust it, change it, put it somewhere else. And at the end of the day, it belongs here as of now. And um, we, we're fans of it. Yeah. And I have to say personally, it brings me back to my soccer coaching days because there's all this, there's a lot of movement, you know, and a, lot of, a lot of facilitation there, but it's, it's I think, mostly you have to pay it gets them up and moving around. When you definitely have to pay attention. And so I'm, I'm very fortunate that I'm there, obviously, and that I can walk around and facilitate the groups while it's taking place. Because if you're, if you're not paying attention, then, you know, you have yeah, to be present. I, I, I will present. just add that if we ever get to do this with all of you live at some point, we will do that exercise. I promise. Yes. And some of you who, who may have attended the WICSAP training I did with um, Jessica Klein last March, I think it was, we did, we did some of that active listening exercise as part of learning the wellness skills. So enough said about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we have Terry Stewart, who I'm guessing many of you know, since she's, she's Harborview's uh, trainer, uh, sexual assault nurse examiner. She comes and talks to the class about that, that exam and, and, and their role. Uh, we also have uh, advocates. If we're training at CJTC and Burien, typically it's the King County Sexual Assault Resource uh, Center that uh, uh, their, their instructors come from that. But when we travel around, we really, we're really trying to get the different agencies. I know in, when we went up to Bellingham as DBSAs uh, who, to, to talk about their programs and, and their, um, you know, to uh, address their relationships with the officers and, and that sort of thing. So that's been, that's been really helpful. We did that over in Bremerton and as well as Tacoma, we had Rebuilding Hope at those. So that's been a really effective way to just make sure that uh, at least the officers from those areas were really familiar with those, those agencies, if not walking into the class, certainly by the end of it. Right. which is something we always emphasize, by the way, that we want, we expect them to go into these interviewing knowing who their advocate agencies are. 
because mm -hmm. they will be asked that by their facilitators and they need to be able to offer uh, those services and have an understanding of what those services are when they're when they're talking to the the actor uh, victims. Uh, lastly, what we do on that first day is we go over, uh, we, we try to get a prosecutor in to talk about the statutes. Uh, as you might guess, um, the investigators typically have a mind to how, I mean, as they go into these interviews, have to have some sense of what, what the, what the uh, statute is or the violation is so that they can kind of tailor some of their questioning uh, towards th those particular statutes statutes, um, you know, knowing what uh, the elements of a crime are as, as they're uh, interviewing uh, a victim um, is, is uh, most, uh, any, any trained investigator would tell you that's, that's a necessary part of, of conducting an interview. So that's why we put that on that, that very first day. Busy day number two. <laughs> Go for it, Amy. Oh, so yes, so Day two is one of those days that just leaves you extremely exhausted by the end of the day, but in such a rewarding way. Um, we start off early in the morning where I'll come in. Jen's usually working with meeting with the actors who, again, they're professionals. I've been working with them, some of them for over 15 years now. They're amazing at what they do. Um, she'll be working with them outside uh, the classroom. So I will come in. Um, oftentimes, if one of my partners is with me, I'll ask him to co-instruct, but the, we don't have much time in, in the morning to review the sexual assault investigation model, the guidelines that we have. We have actually on cardstock a nice uh, reference card that they can take into their practice interviews with them. So if they're stuck, a lot of time went into this, this um, card as far as there's bullet points on some really trauma-informed um, questions that they can ask. So we, I remind them of that. Um, I also like to remind them of a grid where where they're going to be, where they're going to go, you know, who's where, you know, because sometimes with those grids, especially if we have a larger classroom with many students, it can get a little confusing. So we do that in the morning before we break out into our interview exercise. Um, so we have two different opportunities for them to practice a specific scenario in uh, on day two. So their first, their, their first exercise, we have it broken down into um, the scenarios are all, all real life scenarios that we have actually spent a lot of time um, developing and fine tuning as we, we need to. Um, so they get assigned a specific scenario and we will walk through um, the facilitator will be with them in this interview setting as, long, as well as two of their peers. And we will walk through the model with them. That way they have an understanding of what to expect. You know, what type of arrangements and preparation have you done prior to um, making this phone call or scheduling this interview with this victim? Um, we'll walk through the expectations, what they're going to do, and the the tough one I always leave for the end during facilitation is, okay, now that we've done all of that, before you even um, welcome the survivor in, is what wellness skill are you going to try today? You know, have at least two that you're thinking you may be able to authentically try to uh, weave into your interview today. And so that's always a tough one because some people are just aren't comfortable with them. And I will say, well, let's we're here for a reason, let's try, and, and they do. And they're always impressed with how it works and how well, it, how well um, tending to and being attentive to the victim when they're activated is beneficial to everybody. So it's pretty amazing to see happen, happening live. So they get two different opportunities. Um, they get a half an hour to actually do their interview and that's everything. That's from the introduction and the rapport building, and we're going to go over more of that in a little bit, but through the entire interview, um, two different opportunities, and then at the end of that exhausting day is when we will come back to the classroom and um, debrief on, on um, how those went, and just again, they're, they're I, must, I must be big into energies, but the, the energies in the room are kind of like, there's a little more relaxed at that point because probably have had some stress energy up during their practice interviews. And by the time we come back to debrief, everyone's like, 
there's this camaraderie where we did this together. You know, we've been in, we did that together. We fought the good fight and um, so we debriefed uh, at that point. And yeah, I, I just there. wanted to add, I mean, even, even before they go into that interviews on that, on that day too, um, Amy and, and our officer from uh, uh, WSU Curtis Whitman typically give them, uh, show them a video with Brad Graham and, and from some of you who are from the Tacoma area may know, know Brad, he, uh, he, he's another one of the architects of this, <laughs> of this training, that he, he did an interview, uh, he did a recording uh, with one of our actors portraying a, 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 one of the scenarios. And so the, the investigators get a chance to review that prior mm -hmm. going, to going in. We've, we've also done that live just to mm -hmm. model what that might look like for them and mm -hmm. again you know as amy amy referenced i mean what's what's new to the most of them are incorporating wellness skills and, mm -hmm. and brad does a really nice job of of integrating that in his his practice interview so that they get a sense of that but one of the things that we always emphasize on those wellness skills is you know the more that you're practicing them yourself the more natural it will be for you to introduce them to somebody that you're working with so right. we also and, and have Curtis and Curtis and I are really, um, uh, we make, we're very intentional about making sure that just because you've heard us um, integrate wellness skills in an interview setting or Brad, remember these are just these are just examples. We we want you to practice and and be authentic with who you are. Like we know that it's a new skill for many of you and. I, we just make sure that when, like we're not asking you to be Brad Graham. We want you to. We want to give you some different examples and encourage you to develop what feels authentic and true to you, right? And so, and the, and they they take that. They take that and they really try to integrate things that this feels natural to me. And they're ver they they vocalize if something doesn't feel natural to them. And I yeah. I I really like that. I'm going to move on. So this this interview model, I mean, it's nothing I, you know, I've been as a as a criminal investigator, I did interviews throughout my career. Um, and and this is really, you know, you break it down into making those arrangements, uh, how you're going to you introduce yourself, making those introductions, that rapport building that's really important, you know, talk about something that's that's that uh, fosters some sort of connection outside of um, the reason that that uh, victim or survivor has has come to you in the first place, um, but just getting to know the person a little bit, um, and then then th there's the event inquiry, uh, which is going to be detailed questions about the assault. And what we tell the officers is that that by this uh, by by the nature of their role, they are they are uh, re activating that trauma. They are likely reactive or activating that that trauma in those victims and survivors, and and that's the reason that we incorporate these wellness skills is to for for both the investigator and victim survivor endurance and engagement in that process, because uh, you know if somebody gets activated, and we'll we'll talk more about that when we talk about the wellness skills, that their ability to provide information is going to be inhibited. Um, and, and I don't, you know, I, I know we're speaking to the choir here. All of you probably have a very strong understanding of trauma and the impacts of trauma. Um, and being reactivated in that fight, flight, or freeze mechanism, or the tend and befriend, as it may be, um, mm -hmm. that that uh, the person you're talking to may not be able to continue that that interview, or may need a break, or you know, just to be really aware of what's happening with that that victim or survivor at that particular time. So we'll, right. we'll explain more of that as we get to the wellness skills, but uh, knowing that this this event inquiry, when you're, when you're trying to elicit details of that event, that it could be, uh, it, it could- uh, Activate. Yeah, it could be activating and it, um, it could be, we could need a pause. And the other, the other thing, I mean, with the endurance, it's, you know, when, when, when the victim or survivor leaves that interview, I mean, the hope is that they'll stay engaged with the, the criminal justice process. Um, 
and you know to to offer them some skills um, through the interview, which is going to be an intense experience, um, can be very useful for the the victim going forward. I mean, we say we know you're not therapists, you're not advocates, you're you're investigators. Yet, you know, we have this opportunity to offer the, these wellness skills right. um, that you're also practicing, by the way, um, mm -hmm. to the benefit of, of uh, these victims and survivors. And I'm going to so mention then, briefly that um, yeah. this model was derived from, I mean, a lot of work went into to researching other models, other state models, other national models. Um, we're familiar with FETI, we're familiar with the PEACE model. And this was derived, our model was primarily derived after the Washington State Child Abuse and Assessment um, course model. And obviously it's a, it's, we had adjusted it and adapted for adult victims, but I wanted just to give that, um, yeah, I wanted absolutely. to give that shout out to Washington State Child Abuse and Assessment. Yeah, and the whole training, as a matter of fact. I mean, we, we looked at what they were doing and anytime I'd asked somebody about interviewing training, they told me that was the best training they'd ever been to. So <laughs> um, so we, we did what, I mean, we took components of that to build this model. And just in the closure, just, you know, any safety planning that needs to happen, I know that as advocates that you do a lot of that with uh, victims and survivors as well. But with that closure, you know, just making sure that they have an understanding that there could be delays, you know, some expectation setting is supposed to be happening there. So, um, but again, mo many of these things are, are already familiar to, most of the investigators are already doing these things. So it's just one of the nuances of, of what we're doing in this training is really emphasizing that rapport building. It's like, be real, you know, be uh, authentic in, in your interactions with that uh, victim right. or survivor and, uh, you know, just be thorough. As, as we're going through these. And I really like how intentional we were on allowing enough time in our practice interviews for the arrangement introduction and closure part, right? Because mm -hmm. it's really, we're conditioned sometimes as investigators to need a lot of time in the event inquiry, right? We need elements of crime, so we, have, we need sensory details. And then also um, rapport building. However, when we think about adult survivors and victims, they do not have to stay involved in our cases, right? And so I think that making that genuine and authentic connection early on and making sure those expectations are met early on. Um, and then at closure, you know, I, you know, we're always hoping we're going to see them again for our next um, part two of the interview or the follow-up. Are they going to meet us at the um, ER for the examination or wherever it may be. So actually spending quality, being really intentional about allowing quality time there where in our child abuse and assessment course, we don't necessarily, they're very important, but we don't necessarily, it's a different dynamic. Child, people are, caregivers are bringing children in to see us. So we pretty much know our hope that they're going to come in. And so that's something that meant quite a bit to me as we develop this um, because I know because we're dealing with such different dynamics here and so just uh, we just wanted to reference I see that we uh, we have 15 minutes on the clock <laughs> oh, <good laughs> material <laughs> um, so uh, you know that we have these these key interview guidelines and they have I mean all of our facilitators have this list of things they're looking for and this kind of summarizes some of those those guidelines I mean again they're, they're the key ones uh, that we want to leave you with today um, but uh, it's a it's a pretty intensive process with both the facilitator participation, their peers reviewing them. There's no, there's no grade or anything. I mean, we're really looking for any outliers, anyone who's like ex an exceptional interview, who we, who we want to recruit as a facilitator, or if somebody is really needs, needs more um, uh, support around their, their interviewing practices. So for the most part, we find that people are falling within that range and, you know, there are adjustments throughout the, the course of, of that interviewing exercise, which is great. Right. Um, but this is, yeah, these are the, you know, that, that question, uh, tell me more about that or Amy, uh, what are you yeah. able to tell me about that? You know, making sure that those open-ended questions are, are featured. And we really, we, we really ask them to be open to, because if you come from the child abuse and assessment course, which many of them have, 
they're they're pretty good with the open-ended questions, which um, I'm a huge fan of because if when you ask those open-ended prompts, we're tapping into that recall memory and um, that's where we're going to hopefully get that narrative response, whether it be fragmented or not, we're, we're going to take what we get. Um, but also incorporating that invitational language. Um, when you're ready, tell me what you're able to remember. Um, and that's something that we get a lot of positive feedback on um, because that's that trauma informed language, that invitational language. Um, and then also I'll add the the sensory focused questions are really important and we strategize with the facilitators, we will strategize with our students about those as well, reminding them that oftentimes um, when we ask those sensory focused questions, we are tapping into that trauma memory, which some people want to shy away from because of the, act, the fear of, we don't use the word trigger, we use activation, but some people are not comfortable with that when as, an, as a neutral objective fact finder, we wanna be comfortable with that. And we're also giving you the wellness skills to be attentive to somebody if they are activated, because we wanna be able to get those compelling details that will stand up in court to help um, this victim in, in their journey, right? So- um, To hold the offender accountable, of course. <laughs> correct, that's, that's the goal, one of the goals. Okay, next. So, yeah, I also just wanted to say about the scenarios. Many of them, they were either real, actual cases that, that some of the investigators brought or advocates brought to us, or they were stories told to me. Um, uh, or, uh, yeah, or cases we've events. had. Right. What, the, the, the case that Jen mentioned, or the interview that Jen mentioned earlier, um, that we show the morning of um, portions of it, depending on how much time that we have was an actual case that I worked on um, back in my county and that we went to trial on twice and this person was in a position of authority and and um, trust and and um, anyhow it's just they're real life yeah. cases all uh, names have been changed you know all of those completely <laughs> so completely also we do I mean there is a, a, a requirement for the training for us to incorporate you know some diversity which we have and most of that uh, so that those considerations if it's somebody LGBTQ um, or you know elderly population that those those factors are considered in that interviewing process so we have scenarios representing those different populations as well so that's we're going to keep talking about some of the tips you know some of the things that you would kind of uh, expect us to to emphasize you know having those that uh, certain mindset and demeanor having awareness of your body language uh, that pacing, making sure the pacing is slow and deliberate, um, the open-ended questions. And then we ask them to avoid these other things that, that unfortunately we've seen too many examples of primarily on TV, but you know, maybe some of you have encountered these as well um, in, in, our, in, our, in our field. So we're really trying to get away from some of that, you know, just the facts, ma'am, um, mm -hmm. line of questioning. Um, so that they're really more engaged and conversational in their, their interactions. I make sure to really talk about the importance of empowerment here, um, especially at the beginning of the arrangements um, and the demeanor, because we really want them to broaden that lens of self-awareness. Many of us, many of them already are very self-aware, but we want them to even um, encourage it as much, as much as possible and being really aware of that natural um, imbalance of power going into an interview setting. And so even if it's just a reminder for some of yeah. those that are already trauma informed, it, it's worth repeating and um, being creative with um, in our training. Absolutely. Thank you for that reference, Amy. So day three. <laughs> um, Again, this is the, the day, the final day of the training after they've done the interviewing, they're a little relieved, a little more relaxed, uh, and we go into some of the, the technical aspects of their investigation as well as the legal aspects. And if any of you have seen uh, the Word Watch presentation, we have that done by Mary Laskowski or Reedy uh, from the Sexual Violence Law Center. Uh, I'm not going to attempt her 
her last name. One of these days, I'll be able to pronounce it correctly. Uh, but they have both provided that word watch training uh, that's been really helpful, I think, very eye opening to folks about language and language of consent versus, uh, you know, uh, lang uh, language of force and those types of things. So uh, then we have a prosecutor coming in talking more about um, report writing documentation, what's important for them. And uh, there's always an emphasis in, on not including opinions in, in, the, in those reports. So really being aware of what that looks like and how to avoid that. Um, and then we have uh, typically either Prosecutor, we, we also just um, just as we do with the advocates, we try to bring when we when we travel to different locations, we try to make sure that the uh, prosecuting attorney of the office in that particular area is involved in some component of the training, whether it's the first day in statutes or one of these other topics. But we we tend to close it out with the prosecutor. Typically, uh, Megan Winder uh, from Thurston County. She's been she's been very consistent in uh, providing these presentations on overcoming the consent defense and then drug and uh, drug facilitated sexual assaults, which we've had the Tox Lab uh, assist on a, a couple of times. The Washington State Tox Lab, which has been really helpful too in, in terms of understanding some of the different drugs and their impacts. Uh, but that's that, and that's. Pretty much how we we close out the, the training and i just i did want to make another reference that we have the attorney general's office with the sexual assault kid initiative and cold cases talking about the the, the differences and how you might be interacting with um, a victim you know on a on an ongoing current case versus versus a cold case uh, and we also have this and amy amy knows this that we we move this multidisciplinary team Around, I mean, we're doing that throughout the training, but we always just want to reemphasize that um, when and where we can to say this is how we conduct these investigations is by bringing all of these these folks yeah. together. One of my partners, Officer Whitman, and I do the MDT SART presentation, and we we're super flexible because we're usually there consistently throughout the three days, and so we're we're going to go where we need to go. And this topic can go anywhere. We personally like when it goes towards the end of um, our our course because we're re-emphasizing what we've already heard for the majority of our training, um, incorporating that multidisciplinary team approach to investigating sexual assault crimes, right? And we always um, talk about the importance of not only having community-based advocates but system-based advocates at the team and. It's always a really interesting yet nice response to see um, just different areas, different um, counties, jurisdictions in Washington, how some have very, as, as you guys all probably are aware, very strong MDTs where others are still help, will ask, will say, who should I reach out to to start our MDT? And we, we welcome questions like that, obviously. Okay. Next. Next. Okay. So we told you about these wellness skills, and this is where uh, we want to just, uh, particularly with what we're going through now and some of the anxieties and stressors of these, these uncertain times, although I'd argue all times are uncertain, um, but these even more so because of what's happening with COVID-19. And uh, I'll, I'll just say that Amy and I have been in training in this pretty regularly at my organization. So we've, we've taken it out of the context of the sexual assault uh, investigations and now our training staff at, at CJTC um, because these wellness skills are so transferable, adaptable to really any population. And that's one of the reasons that we brought it into the sexual assault training, um, investigations training, because uh, they, are, they are so useful and they're biologically based. You know, it's, it, it has a lot to do with being aware of and regulating your nervous system. Um, and once, once you understand that uh, and, and apply these wellness skills, that uh, your well being can improve, right, Amy? I, I, I can personally attest to having used this model. I've done a lot of my own recovery and um, therapy, and a lot. I have a background in mindfulness and meditation. And I, you know, so I've searched a lot of different models, and this one really brings. A lot of those things together and, and I have a great appreciation for it and I think the benefits of it in this training have been really uh, 
great and the feedback on it has been very positive too so uh we're we're also excited to do to to just share you know some of the content of this because you may be seeing this you may be hearing this out with out there with the investigators you're working with as, as well as some of these other features of the training but we want you to know kind of what this is and and why we're using it how it's being used and how you might might your, yourselves uh want to use it and again if you were at the March 2019, boy, that seems like a long time ago. <laughs> sure Training does. we did at the Red Lion Inn at SeaTac. Uh, this is this is the model that Jessica and I and I trained in. I think there are about 30 or 40 of you present for that. But um, so this may be a little bit of a repeat. But just so you know what it is, and uh, for those of you who weren't in, in attendance there, we may go a little over. And I'm just you know if you can stay, I, I ask that you do stay because. Your well-being is really important um, and this could give you some these may be things you're already doing but just you know some reminders about some tools uh, in that toolbox that you can access as, as we're going through these stressful times amy do you want to talk about the resilient zone and just oh sure just a, so, just a little description of what that is as we yeah. move through this so the resilient zone which we talk about in we teach in our SAI program as well. It, we, we talk about that is our okay zone where we're able to handle the daily stressors that life hands us the best of our ability, where we're able to not only tend to ourselves and make the best decisions, but also tend to and make decisions for our loved ones and our community, right? Because we're, we're talking usually to officers so we want them to stay within their okay zones so that they're at their best selves so we make sure that we remind we're very intentional about this is not a place where everything's happy this is not necessarily a place where you don't feel your feelings because that's not remember it's body-based it's somatic so we are dynamic beings and we're going to feel things throughout the day but being within this zone is where we want to stay if we're wanting to make those best decisions possible. And as Jen mentioned, we've been doing a lot of these presentations recently amid our pandemic, amid uncertainties, amid uncertainty. Um, and so many people are out of their zones and because maybe they're not necessarily in tune with their nervous system or embodied or however you're, you wanna say it, they don't really understand why and it's not, it's not, a, it doesn't feel okay, which, which many of us know. So reminding people that our resiliency zone is where we're at our best self. So we're able to um, have charges and releases throughout the day, but still able to um, feel those feelings and, and, and move on with our, the, the decisions we need to make. We also normally uh, uh, weave the neurobiol neurobiology and physiology and with this we're not doing that today but this is based on those understandings of how the brain and body works and how they talk to each other and that again the, the nervous system and having some awareness of the nervous system and that that regulation of the nervous system so we incorporate that into the training that uh, you're not you're not getting today um, but you know just to give you an overview of what these skills entail and what you know, some of the components that the officers get about, you know, being stuck in a high zone um, or a low zone. I think Amy already referenced. You know, it's that when you get active, when when uh, somebody is activated, either the officer or the or the victim, it's survivor, or or just all of us as humans going through this experience right now, that uh, we can get bumped out of what's our our normal zone, and you know, either high in anxiety or low in depression. And either way, we're not able to engage. We don't have that composure. We don't have the, the endurance um, needed to get through that particular event. So we really try to encourage people to try to find that middle of zone and widen their zones when and where possible by through wellness skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these, these uh, skills that we've, we've taken from the, the uh, community resiliency model, by the way, I meant to to hold up the book it's building resilience to trauma by the trauma resource institute that's been our our, our resource for for this this model uh, there are six wellness skills we've taken four of them that really are already or could uh, potentially be components of the interview training and those those four are uh, tracking 
uh, resourcing, grounding, reset now, just as you see on the screen. And we'll go into a little description of that. Uh, again, with my mindfulness meditation background, I like the tracking. The tracking is essential. And officers know this as, you know, having self-awareness, situational awareness, um, as well as that self-regulation. I mean, that all belongs in the tracking, that just really having awareness, having awareness of themselves and how they're presenting um, or what, how they're coming into an interview and having awareness of those victim and survivor responses and reactions, yeah. you know, how, how critical that is. And to, you know, to notice those things, being able to read the sensations, you know, if somebody's, you know, like the, if they're withholding their breath or, or, you know, they're tensing up or moving away, you know, all of those things could be, could, uh, uh, could give uh, that, that officer some, some awareness about where that victim or survivor is in, in those responses. So the tracking is a foundational skill um, that we heavily emphasize in the training. And then, you know, one of the things we're talking about in tracking, and, and this is why it's important for those, those personal practices of tracking, is, is having some understanding what your own sensations are. You know, for, I'll pose a question right now. I don't have the opportunity to look at your, your faces, but just having some more awareness is like, what are my sensations? What am I noticing on the inside? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm noticing, you know, I feel pretty at ease. I'm noticing some warmth in, in my chest. I'm noticing, you know, my shoulders are somewhat relaxed. You know, so th just those things that, you know, connect our bodies and our, our brains, really. Um, and that language of sensation that's not many familiar to many of us, but just having some, some emphasis on that. And I want to add, just because I think it's important for... I think people will relate to this, that we in our training, we do make sure that we talk a lot about the idea of how we're conditioned, investigators are conditioned to ask questions about thinking and feeling and how this is different mm -hmm. and how learning the language of sensation is pretty new for many people because we're conditioned to ask, tell me everything you were thinking when that happened. Tell me every, how you're, how, tell me what you felt when that happened. Um, and so this is a little different because when we ask about sensations, you know, those are usually like warm and like Jen just mentioned, um, um, maybe tingly, maybe goosebumps, maybe, oh, I got a chill. Um, you know, those sensation language, that sensation language is often not something that's really comfortable for many people, um, especially if, if there's trauma histories involved. So, yeah, and all of this is really, I mean, just, you know, uh, again, that, that nervous system awareness regulation, it's for that purpose of bringing people back to the here and now, you know, that these, these skills are designed for that, um, which I really like as a mindfulness person, you know, that, that they, these are just uh, mechanisms to bring a person because right here and right now, for me right here and now, everything's just fine, you know, but if, if I'm recalling a stressful event, then my, you know, my heart rate might increase, my breathing might get shallower, I might start to tense up, you know, just having that, that recognition of, or trying to bring somebody back to the here and now. So that's what a lot of these are. Resourcing, exactly what it sounds. Uh, you know, we do this in the rapport building, you know, they may have a friend or somebody who they've really counted on to kind of help get them through this, and maybe one of you as advocates, uh, but they may mention a pet or, you know, in, in, in a resource is any person, place, or thing that makes you feel calm, pleasant, peaceful, strong, or resilient, any of those, those features, um, you know, and we all, we all have them because we're all relying on something right now to kind of get through these, these challenge. And maybe you could consider your own resources. What are your resources? Um, you know, question. I don't, the yeah. question we ask, we've been asking a lot lately, as well as in our classes, um, think about something or someone that's helping you get through this, that has helped you get through this, or that is current, what, what, however you want to word it. And that is so broad, but yet at the same time, we're tapping into that resource, right? So that their minds can start generating those thoughts of that person. And you can almost see their nervous system change. You can see their demeanor change. You can see um, a shift in their body language. Um, and we're asking officers to pay attention to that, to track that, that first wellness skill, track that when you ask about that resource. And if you can see that difference in their nervous system, intensify it by saying, 
tell me more about when if you're able tell me more about whatever that resource is that they identified right and so this is one of the wellness skills that we really um, pra we actually practice in class quite a bit yeah, I, I will always say you can't have too many resources. So we're really, we're giving this, um, you know, we're, uh, you're getting just a, a quick overview. I mean, it's it's the experience of it, like any of this, that really is going to be more more beneficial. So we'll, we'll have some references at the end of this training because the Trauma Resource Institute is doing a lot of trainings right now uh, for the month of May. It's wellness month for them. So they're doing a lot of online trainings in this model uh, and, and we'll, reference that at the at the end of this, but you're, we're just giving you a really, just a real snippet of it, and it almost doesn't do it justice. It to, doesn't. <laughs> to talk about it and not experience it, because it really, again, is about the experience. And I would just tell you that that's my dog, Breed a Dog, and that's the very first ever uh, SAI VSERT class back in November 2019. All resources, resources for me, when I look at these pictures, it 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 bring it, you can probably see it brings a smile to me my face and my dog just got up in the background so you'll see that she she does that too unless she's distracting me from a presentation. Is that weird that your resource brings a smile to me too? Is that weird? That's not no. You can you can, I can share my resource. Oh, I guess I'm in that picture. <laughs> you are in that picture. So the grounding uh, the grounding skill. I see some participants are leaving. Hang in here just a little little while longer. The grounding skill is just what you would expect it to be. Uh, and that a skill that, that the investigators have found a lot of value in. And this is just having, uh, noticing where you have contact with the surface. And, you know, we typically say, you know, maybe go to the, the hands um, or the feet just because of all the nerve endings, particularly in the hands. I like, I like to as we get a class started and I have, you know, I'm, I'm maybe a little bumped up in my resilience zone, a little anxious about all the things that happen, have to happen <laughs> to get that class started, that I will put my hands on a podium or on a table and ground myself. You know, I just bring, if I can just bring my attention there and like any of these skills, it just requires practice, but that's something that can bring somebody back to the here and now pretty immediately. And when I go back to the here and now, I'm like, I'm okay. I'm here. I'm right here. You know, I got this. So that's that's a, a skill. Um, again, wherever somebody has contact, if you know, mm -hmm. in that gravitational situation is so critical to many of us. Um, you know, again, bringing us to the here and now. I know we're just we're breezing through these, and I, uh, for a deeper dive, I really recommend you you uh, work with the the Trauma Resource Institute in their online trainings coming up next week. Uh, and the reset now, again, these are things officers may be doing. I mean, we know officers typically, and if they're not, we're encouraging them to you know, bring an extra mm -hmm. bottle of water. You know, if, if somebody gets dysregulated during the, the, uh, the interview, that various ways, really having them attuned to a particular sense um, can be really helpful. And that's what each one of these reset now skills does is they, they attune, they help somebody attune to a particular sense, whether it's naming six colors in the room, noticing sounds inside the room, noticing sign, sounds outside the building. All of those things can really help um, mm -hmm. a victim come back to the here and now. And we um, encourage and, our officers to keep practicing. Like, yeah, yeah they, they may try it for the first time in class, but then we, obviously, we encourage them to take that back and keep practicing because then it becomes really conversational. It doesn't, yeah. You know, one like like any new like any new skill, right? So, because I I've, I've learned these now what almost two years ago these wellness skills, and so when you when I see activation, when I see somebody tapping into that trauma memory and thinking thinking about what happened and telling me, but then the activation sets in where you can just tell that it's not feeling right i can then just conversationally say did it just get really did, did it just get really cold in here or geez i just i don't know if somebody turned on the and it, it, it's almost immediate and i yeah. think because they, they instantly go from this feeling of fear or trauma or pain whatever it may be to so 
feeling a different sensation, sensing a different sensation, or sometimes because we have ridiculous fabric on chairs in my old interview room, like I can't figure out what this is. And then they'll instantly do the same thing. My goal isn't the fabric. <laughs> my goal is being attentive and caring to their needs at that moment, yet not allowing or not requiring a break. I want to continue getting those details. So to see them practice these and then go to the second interview and kind of not master it, but get a little more comfortable in the second opportunity, that's really encouraging as somebody that's learned these skills as and an instructor. And I'm guessing some of, many of you are doing some of these already, but just so you know, this is that that the officers are learning these things as now as well. And we also do a voluntary, we don't we started by requiring it, but now we do a voluntary session, resiliency session for the officers where we, we talk a little bit more about some of the negativity bias, some of the other features of the brain that make some of these skills important, particularly for uh, officers who are likely feel, uh, experiencing some vicarious trauma, if not direct trauma. So in this, this whole model is based, you know, identifying those sensations of distress and then being able, uh, accessing some tools to, to go into those sensations of well-being. And we talk about the building of the neural pathways along those lines and everything else. So that's, that's what that is and why we do it. Yay. And uh, here's an app. They have, uh, they have an app that uh, the uh, director, former director, she's now the creative innovation design, whatever her, her title is, that she's the one who, who um, create, helped develop uh, this this model uh, does a really nice job of giving it an overview and and um, uh, yeah so that's that's a good training tool for you if you're interested in to go to the IHL app that's what it looks like yep uh, so we had mentioned that for more training on the community resiliency model uh, they're doing wellness May they have here's a description of their training. Um, and uh, go to the Trauma Resource Institute. There are some three-hour trainings. We're delivering one to first responders next Monday, and the following Monday, they're breaking it up into two three-hour sessions, uh, so you could um, uh, get some of their trainings. They're doing it for healthcare providers. They're doing it for all community members on Tuesday, uh, the next two Tuesdays, so just uh, so you're aware that that's out there, and that's ongoing. It's just kind of interesting uh, coincidence that they happen to be doing this and we're doing this training today. Mm -hmm. So back to the SAI training, uh, as we as we get to, uh, I think we'll just a couple more minutes, bear with us. Uh, what we're doing right now is we have a couple of ongoing projects, including we're developing, we were, we were developing some online training, but quickly realized that a PowerPoint wasn't going to convey some of the uh, give it enough context to the work we're doing and the training we wanted to accomplish. So we are at this moment uh, putting a patrol a video together for patrol officers for their interactions with uh, sexual assault victims um, and survivors. So uh, with those those initial interactions, knowing that those could really really uh, make a difference, that those are so really critical. Um, to the victim experience as well as the outcome of um, a, or a, all outcomes. Uh, so that's happening. We hope to have that released very soon because especially with that on the the uh, social distancing training demands <laughs> that are that are forthcoming. Um, I'm anticipating more more online options for us. We're we're working towards that. I know Amy's also working that in, on that in the CAIA. Uh, we're, uh, we're just that's just the way the way we're moving um, in addition to that we just had some legislation pass this last session for case review model so it's really a way of us going back to departments and evaluating the impact of our training uh, in this first phase we are supposed to be developing a model with a multidisciplinary team which so is exciting we're doing all of our work so we're what the plan is for us to go into a particular department and just Learn about how they're conducting their investigations, um, but really, again, it's it's a it's a way for us to know if if our training, uh, whether there are any gaps in the training, whether there have been benefits of the training, to really look at the training, what what in what need what we need more of, and look at those investigations and case files and everything else. So, um, I'm excited about that, and I'm excited to team of 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 our experts to 
um, put that that model together and present it to uh, the legislator and, and governor in this next year. So these are the things that's happening. This is an ever ever evolving <laughs> program, thankfully. Um, it's gotten some great support from from our legislator and governor and uh, as well as our, our stakeholders. So and we continue to be engaged in WICSAP. WICSAP, thank you. I mean, WICSAP has been especially supportive. Um, Very supportive. So that's what's happening. I just, uh, if you have any questions, I think you'll be, be putting those into the chat. And as we close out, I just, one, this is my second two year anniversary with CJTC today. And, and it's mm -hmm. been really lovely to spend it with all of you. We really appreciate the work you're doing. The work we do. is so important. Um, so thank you. Uh, keep taking care of yourselves uh, as well. So and thank thanks you please so much, Jen please, and Amy. Yeah, please reach out. We're we're definitely available. Yeah, that was absolutely wonderful. I know that you know it doesn't come close to replicating <laughs> the the three days, but thank you for that overview, and um, thank you to all the participants for attending as well please don't hesitate to reach out. Like I said, this will be archived and located on the WICSAP website, and you'll receive a follow-up email tomorrow with more information, including slides. So thank you again, Jen and Amy. It was well, wonderful thank you, for all your, you've done for this and for all you're doing with WICSAP. So thank you. Great, great work, everyone. Thanks. Right, take, care. take care out there. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.